Good evening, Andrew. And Marie is still muted, it looks like. Oh, and Janine's joined us, that's great. She may not be there. Oh, what a dreary day. Uh, we were due for one, I guess. I beg your pardon? I said, I guess we were due for one. Oh yeah, overdue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably overdue. The heart behind your your left shoulder is that uh, something from India? No, it's actually from a. Have you ever heard of a band called Tedeschi Trucks? No, I'm afraid I haven't. <laughs> it's a it's a sign poster from a a band. Yeah. Okay. It's a the. Is it fabric as a T-shirt or something or? No, it's a it's a print. It's a, it's a poster. Okay. Yeah. Very attractive. I just didn't okay. recognize. There's they, actually a, a Valentine's that it's in um. It's a theater in DC. I can't recall the which theater it is. It's only like it sat like twenty five hundred or so. Okay. Can't, yeah, but it was uh the son of one of the Allman brothers. That's it. That's the band. Yeah. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Tim. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? You doing okay? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Good, good. Hey, Rob and Ted and Emery. Oh, how are you? Is that your music, Tim? Could you turn Hello. it uh, down or off, please? Yeah. Very Thanks. sensitive ears. <laughs> everybody hey bonnie Hi. how are you okay good thanks tim ted when we start on the um the uh, election thing would you like me to set the stage i'll try to be quick uh that's fine i'm thinking what we might do depending upon i'm watching the attendees i think there's going to be some there may be more attendees for the second item on the agenda we might reverse them uh and have the, thinking about that um i i did suggest that joan reader might want to attend and not she's on she's already on yeah but um uh, i'm just looking i'm watching the attendees okay I, I had some correspondence from a couple of people who thought they were going to attend i don't see them on here yet so but the answer to your question is yes, that'd be fine. Okay. There's Glenn. 15 seconds to spare. 
Well, according to my computer, it's already six o'clock. <clears throat> Okay, looks like, all right, well, it is uh, six o'clock and we are all here. So I think we could go ahead and get started. I don't see the other people that had expressed an interest in uh, attending yet. So anyway, uh, so it is uh, Thursday, November, November the 12th at 6 p.m. and we are here for a public hearing. Uh, we have a public hearing regarding two different subjects uh, this evening uh, and, um, the first item on the agenda is the public hearing to discuss uh, and discussion regarding the proposed amendment of the city of Lewis's charter as it relates to municipal elections. I, we are here for a, public dis for a public hearing. So what I'd like to do is make sure we hear from the public first, if at all possible. And then uh, if we wanna talk about other concerns that we have, we'll come back to that. But I think it's important that we hear from the public because that's what, that's what we have advertised it as or posted it as. So Rod, you had volunteered to sort of set the stage on this item. Would you like to go ahead? If you're handling the election ordinance first, yes. Yes, okay. please. Yeah, well, the uh, elections are, is, is uh, addressed by the city in its code and in its charter. In September, we amended the code uh, to basically make it consistent with and not repetitive of the state code. We also added one provision which allows us to permit absentee voting for health reasons. This is now the charter we're addressing. The charter in section seven, um, it also needs to be made consistent with the state code and preferably not repetitive of it. The danger of being repetitive is that we might repeat it uh, in a way that doesn't match what the state does or changes its charter, its laws to say. So we, um, it, this revision would clean it up somewhat. The, uh, there aren't any significant changes except two, uh, two really, I think. The first is a small one, and that is that it deletes the requirement that, we, that votes be counted in public. And the only reason for that is that I'm not sure we do. And I wouldn't want to require that um, our election judges uh, have to stand out in the rain and, and count votes so that everybody in the public can see. I think there's provision for watching it, but I'll defer to Joan on that. I see that she's an attendee and I, I, I hope she'll speak to that. The other change would permit, not require, the city to use the state's voter registration system instead of its own. Uh, and that, I think, um, caused some, some concern already. And that, I expect, will be the, the one focus of discussion, at least when it comes to the city council after this hearing. Mayor, that's what I wanted to OK, say. great. And I do see that uh, Joan is on, and she has been the chair of our election uh, board for a long time. And I certainly would invite Joan to comment, or anyone else who's in the chat. Uh, I see we've been joined by a couple of other people now, but uh, Joan, if you would like to, we can elevate you and you can comment if you would like. You need to I just did. I, Great, thank she you. She should be able to be on the screen now. Okay, yeah. You. Okay. We um, can hear you, Joan, can we just you can't hear me see you. Yeah, we can um, hear you, we can't see you. Yeah, I don't know what happened to me. Um, <laughs> I was there. Am Lower left-hand corner, maybe there's a, little oh, yeah there it is there you are there she there is, is. <laughs> hello all hi Joan um I have looked um at the papers um Rob was kind enough to email me everything and um just to address about publicly we do normally count those votes publicly um this year because of COVID we could couldn't allow people in the building were only a few. So I guess um, basically we didn't do it publicly, but we have in the past, there's always been a crowd there and we're, we're working tallying votes. Um, so I don't know how you want to proceed with that. 
<laughs> well, Jeremy, I asked you on that. Uh, when you say you count them publicly, does that mean that anybody and everybody from the public who'd like to watch you count them is permitted? Usually the room is fairly filled. Okay, thanks. Um, and again, with COVID, it was not. We didn't allow people in. I think we allowed the candidates, but I don't recall that any of the candidates were in. Okay. Thanks. Then then I would propose that, that that change be reversed and that we leave the language the way it was, uh, saying that the counting of them will mm -hmm. be public. Yeah, I'll just add that, I'm sorry I didn't catch it the first time through, but section 7578 of title 15 does require, it says any time between the opening and closing of the polls on election day, absentee election judges selected by municipalities board of elections shall count absentee ballots at a properly noticed public meeting. So it, it is right. required. Thanks. Great. Joan, anything else? Um, Glenn, do, does that mean that we can count absentee ballots prior to election day? The, the state code allows you to do a, a couple of the steps. It doesn't allow you to actually do the counting prior to election day. You'd have to count on election day, but you can, you can categorize some of the packets and do those things. But, but actually, the actual counting is on election day. Okay, that's what we did this time. Yeah. Any other comments? Thanks, Joan. Appreciate your You're welcome. input. You're welcome. You're so well versed in this that uh, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Joan, Joan uh, before you get off, would you be willing to give your opinion on using the voter rolls? Well, um, sure. Um, I, I it certainly would be easier for a lot of voters because they don't quite understand that, um, you know, that just because they've been DMV to change their address or whatever and moved into the city, that they had to come into the city to register to vote. Um, a lot of people don't do that. Uh, and I know the city put out a lot of notices. It was out there. You have to register, but people don't read, um, don't, don't quite understand because it is odd. Um, either way is fine with me. I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. Um, I guess from a voter standpoint, it is easier for the voter if you use the state rule, rules. Okay. I appreciate yeah, it. Great. We have a comment in the chat from Jim Berrigan says, I'm a little concerned about using the state's database. Perhaps our own database could be better up to date, be kept up to date a little bit better. Uh, than it has in the past. Do we, we can um, unmute Jim so he can talk if he wants to add more to that. Um, I, I would just say in terms of keeping our database up to date, um, the, the charter is very specific about we can't, we can't make changes right. um, under, under the state law and the state charter and Glenn, you can, you can talk about that. So, so that is one of the things that, that we dealt with this year was um, some of the, some of the, um, I guess, because it had been so long since we had an election, there were um, a number of deceased people who thankfully did not vote um, <laughs> or people who had moved. So, um, so that, that, you know, that, that's an issue, but we're, we're left with what the law states. Um, Jim, I've unmuted you if you want to make a comment. Okay. Glenn, did you want to comment on um, Anne Marie's comment? Well, the, the process that Anne Marie is referring to is, is a process. Can you hear me now? I'm yeah. sorry. Just Go ahead, Jim. We can hear you. You're in twice. Yeah, I know. I was trying to get. Hold on a second, please. I was okay. trying to get. Yeah, you're down to one now. We won't get the echo. Thank you. You're welcome. When Anne Marie mentioned the uh, we can't update the base, database, my question would be who does? Because when I first saw it, when Dennis Reardon ran maybe seven or eight years ago, and I was trying to help him with his campaign, it was, uh, I guess, some changes were lacking, so to speak. And then when he ran again, I looked at the database that we were given and it was 
still lacking and it may be because like Joan Reeder says, people don't understand they have to um, register. I'm not sure who does the changes when people leave or when properties transfer or when people pass away. Maybe you could uh, help me understand that. So, so the way it works is if somebody doesn't vote in two consecutive municipal elections, we send them registered letter or a cer certified letter um, stating that they're being removed from the, the voter registration list. Um, other than that, we even if we know somebody has moved, we can't remove people unless they contact us to be removed. Do, Glenn, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. yeah. And, and Glenn, I, I, Glenn sorry, one thing I'd like to, in your discussion, if I may, one thing I'd like to know is I understand that's the way our charter reads now, but but if you could address, uh, if we're if we're going to change the charter anyway. You know, if we were to keep uh, our own, you know, homegrown roles, can we change the way the roles are maintained and updated, or is that, or is the way we do it now with the certified letter after two elections, is that a creature of state law? No, that's a creature of the charter, and it can be changed. Um, we changed the charter in Rehoboth Beach <laughs> to be more with what the state does. The state does a system where, um, kind of trying to get this right. I knew it well at one time. We, we have a system where after two consecutive elections, in Lewis, where after two consecutive elections go by and a voter does not vote, we then basically purge the registration um, list and take that person off. They get, they get the certified letter, but it, it notifies them that they're taken off. The state does a process, and now Rehoboth Beach has adopted that process, where after, two, after a person misses two elections, Two consecutive elections there's a letter sent to the individual that says we will now move you to what's called an inactive status but not take you off the voter registration list so if you come in the next election and vote you're still recognized on the list you vote and you get moved on to the act back onto the active status or if that individual sends in and says no i really do intend to remain on the registration list please move me back to active they're moved back to active but if that a third election comes and they don't vote, then they're taken off the off the list. So it's a little bit long. Then we've lost you. We've lost your. I can't hear you, Glenn. We can't hear you at all. There, I had, a, I had a telephone call coming in and it jumped onto my iPad. Sorry about that. So, so what I was saying is the state system after that. If you, go, if you go to a third election and there's, the individual has not voted the third time, then they're moved from the inactive status to off the registration list. Right. That's a little bit the reverse of what we're trying to figure out. Our, the system that I think gives us some problems is that if we don't have an election for three or four years, a lot can happen in that three or four years and there's not two consecutive elections to purge the list. So there's still people on the list who may have passed away two or three years ago. So we're, we're trying to, but, but, but yes, to council person knows this question, you can revise those, um, the, the way in which the list is maintained. Yes. Okay. But, right. but I guess Glenn, my question is, it, are there limits to how we can remove somebody in, in terms of maintaining it? Currently, yes. Okay. Cur currently, yeah. You have to change the charter to, to do something different than what we're presently okay, doing. Okay, but but not in common law or state law. We could we could come up with something like an obituary would work, or that's a question I haven't looked into. It, it's okay. a good one. Yeah, I know that right. used to be done. Um, in when I was when I first got involved, there there was someone actually in city hall who reviewed obituaries for. Uh, mm. And Joan's shaking her head yes, so yeah. she remembers it well. I remember that. Yeah, and so uh, that had did happen in the past. Now maybe the change in the election law is what ten years ago may have eliminated that option, right. uh, but uh, I know it was done. Yeah, I mean I don't want to I want to wait until after the public has spoken, but I, just from what Glenn just described, it doesn't sound like it really helps our problem. No. Um, so I've got some ideas we can talk about later, but obviously let's hear from the public. 
Thank you. Does anyone else from the public wish to comment? Raise your hand or- Mr. Mr. Heffernan has something in the chat, but I'm gonna allow him to talk so okay. that he can speak. So you should be able to unmute. Okay, Bob. Can you hear me? Yep, we got, we got you. Okay, well, um, I mean, we had some unusual circumstances this time. Uh, in part, the election was delayed. In part, the city had not had an election in a long time, so it came as a surprise to many people uh, that they had to do a separate registration. And uh, then, as it became apparent to some, uh, you know, some were out of town on vacation and so on with deadlines uh, that would have been in April, uh, people not being able to come back in time for that. And then of course we had COVID. Um, so, you know, the, the thing that worked in favor of voter registration under the old system was that we had more, the, the election was delayed and we had more time. Um, and that the city changed its rules because of COVID to allow people to register by email and other techniques under more or less the um, uh, state of emergency, if you will. So I think those things generally worked out and I would like to see the city, you know, uh, allow those things uh, in the future or even better move to the state roles um, which you know people understand and are more or less automatic when you get a license and all of that um, you know i think in general we we had more people register uh, because of the unique circumstances this year, but I think a lot of people would have been disenfranchised had they uh, had the existing statute been rigorously enforced. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. So I, I do wanna just respond to that a little bit. Um, it had been, I guess, a, a standing practice of requiring people to come in and vote in person but when we were hit with the pandemic, we checked the code, the city code, we checked the charter, and I checked with the Department of Elections and there was nothing statutorily that would prohibit us from continuing to accept online registrations. That was, um, that was just a, a practice. Um, so, so that is something that regardless of, of whether we you know, keep our own registration or use the state, we, we would be able to continue to make registration easier. Yeah. Okay. And the governor was very helpful in all of that in terms of making sure that elections could be held in a timely way. So, okay. Any other comments from the public? It looks like we have Deborah Evald. Deborah, you want to talk to us or would you want us to read this? We can elevate you if you'd like. Deborah, there you are. Just unmute yourself. Hi, Ted. Okay, go ahead. If you, you want to just tell us what you had written. In yeah, the real brief. I'll just read it. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding over the present City of Lewis voter registration process. Um, Anne Marie is aware that I did a lot of reset, of a lot of um, outreach you know, via emails, but also on social media. And there's a great lack of understanding of, um, especially in people moving here, they do not understand why they weren't automatically registered. So if we could sync up with the state system, I think it would make a lot of sense. Okay. Um, I also would like to say that I think we do need to purge our records, but, Syncing up with the state registration could be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else care to comment? Okay, 
hearing nothing from the public, is there someone, does anyone at the table want to comment for her? Bonnie, you said you had some ideas. Uh, I think Tom Panetta just yeah. weighed in. Okay, Tom, just weighed in. Okay, yep, there uh, he is. Said, would there be an issue in using the state system with respect to the residency requirement, which is uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So I, I don't know if you want me to talk now or talk later, it doesn't, whatever. Go ahead. I think, I think we, you know, it's the same. I think, I understand, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, I, I think the, the comments about the state system, because we have motor voter being helpful in getting people into, onto the rolls, or if we synced with that, that that does make sense, but there's a problem, which is just because you live in this, you know, you, let's say you register, we have to make sure that people are bona fide citizens of the city of Lewis. So there's, in terms of bringing people in, we have to make sure that the people who come in um, are, do in fact satisfy that requirement. And the second problem is how to, you know, which it doesn't sound like the state system would help us much with, which is how to, how to keep our, our roles more current. Right. Um, and two things that I was thinking about, or let's just deal with one, but the, the, the one place where anyone coming into the city really needs to go is the Board of Public Works um, right. in terms of getting service, not registering separately for their roles, although that would be good too. But um, so I was thinking if there was a way we could be notified, we, we in the city could be notified that there were changes in accounts, um, that would be very, very current because we could then follow up and say, okay, you know, Ms. Smith has left the city and, you know, Ms. White has come into the city or Mr. White. So that might be one, um, one very timely uh, place that we could deal with this. The, the other thing I was thinking about is, um, I don't know what the practice in Lewis is. I don't think there's a uniform practice um, as to whether or not uh, tenants who obviously, if they're bona fide residents of the city of Lewis can vote, um, whether they're required to sign up for utilities or whether landlords keep utilities in the landlord's name. It varies. That's what I thought. So the place where we might be able to catch that um, in terms of keeping our roles current would be when the landlords um, paid their gross receipts rental tax. We could ask them to, you know, to verify, identify whatever that their, their, their tenant had not changed and if that had changed, you know, get some more information. So those are just two ways to use the, the, the one thing that we know everybody has to go to, the utility uh, things, uh, as a way to keep the rules current. Uh, on, on people uh, passing away, you know, we could do obituaries, I guess, but if someone passes away, but their partner, spouse, whatever, stays in the house, then there's not going to be a change at the BPW, but the likelihood that someone who has passed away where the surviving partner spouse is still here, uh, staying in the same place is, is pretty low. So those are just a couple of thoughts I was having about how we could, I mean, I don't have any answers on how we deal with motor voter and the bona fide residency requirement, but those were a couple of ideas I had on the other piece of it, which is how to keep the current. Just some thoughts. There is another opportunity for notifying. We get property transfers. Uh, we could send a letter of explanation of registration to every property transfer that, that we get. We get those monthly. Uh, so we, for, that could take care of the, the purchasers of property. So they would be yeah. informed whether or not, and then they could make their own decision as to whether or not they're a, a bona fide resident of the city or not. That's another Yeah, because we don't, we don't have anything like in, I mean, in DC, they try to keep you they try to, through the, the license plates, they try to, um, you know, they try to, to exercise some way of forcing people when they leave the city to, you know, to notify the city that they're gone. Yeah, well, uh, you can't do that here. Yeah, no, we don't, well, that's exactly what I was going to say. We don't have it, we, the city, don't have any mechanism like that. The only, the closest thing we have is, is uh, either tracking the, the uh, transfer tax records or the, the Board of Public Works interface. Right. All right. Other comments? Okay. Yes, Deborah, Rob. Deborah Evolts had something in the chat. I don't know if you yeah, want to. Uh, 
very good point, uh, Bonnie. Many out of city residents tried to register to the last election. The difference was not well understood by many living here. BPW list will show part time residents too, wouldn't it? And I think that's true. Yep, that would show the BPW list would show them as well. Rob, you had your hand up. You want to say something? You're muted. There, did you get that? I'm always forgetting that. Um, uh, first, I got a couple of things, Mayor. First, Emory, when somebody comes to City Hall to register, what do they show as an ID? So they've been they've been providing their driver's license. If somebody didn't have a driver's license, we would request a copy of the utility bill, um, so that we could see that that's where it's mailed. You know, again, I un unfortunately I think in a in a beach town to some degree, you're left with um, the, the people being honest and realizing that if they sign something stating that they're a bona fide resident and they're not, then they're falsifying a document. Right. And is that different from the system, if you know, that's used by the, by the state? Well, with the state, most, I, mean, I don't know if it's most, but a lot of the registration is done through the DMV when people go to get their licenses. Um, license only if you are a resident. Right. Yeah. Um, I, so I think that the bona fide resident challenge is no different from, as far as I can see, no different from whether somebody comes to the city to register or goes to the state to register. I'm not sure which way that, whether that cuts either way in terms of adopting the voter registration system of the state. I just wanted to add one other thing. I Never could you mute yourself? We're hearing a lot of background noise. Thank you. Sorry, Rob. I called the Sussex County Board of Elections and asked if any municipality in Delaware has adopted the state system. And they told me that uh, Georgetown had. Right. So I called Georgetown and I asked them about their experience. And the lady I talked to told me that um, uh, this was their first election dealing with using the state system and that it was much simpler. She said there was a little initial work getting onto the state system because they needed to tell the state which addresses were in Georgetown because they have four different wards. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think we'd have, we'd have the same problem, only probably lesser because our, we have only got th three streets to kind of tell this, tell the county where to cut off. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but th that would be our one-time uh, um, effort. Beyond that, apparently it's uh, much simpler. So Janine did some research into this as well, and um, Dover, Smyrna, and Newark also use the list. And I think, um, Mr. Morgan, you mentioned the issue of wards. Part, part of the, and, and I, I know Newark and Dover have this issue too. I don't know if Smyrna does. When, when you have wards or districts and you're using the state list, there's an additional amount of coding. So the, the process, and Janine can explain it if she wants, but the process really is when you do that initial setup, there's this back and forth between the state where they give you the the list the database <laughs> and then you have to go in and code things the way that you need to um make sure that it's only the things that are in the city and and kind of go back and forth to make sure you get it right and janine i don't know if you have anything to add to that i don't have anything um can you hear me okay yes what they told me was that the initial setup to make sure it's within the city because Lewis has addresses that aren't in the city. Um, that would take some time. Um, but then after that, you're all set and you can just pull the list. You just have to let the state know which ones are in and which ones aren't. Okay. So it's upfront work. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other comments from the table? Okay. Hearing none and there's nothing in the chat. Uh, I think we still have some work to do on this a little bit to clarify some things. Um, 
Joan, I thank you very much for your helping us uh, work through this. You're welcome, Ted. And uh, if if I can volunteer to help do something, please call on me. You know we will. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks. All right. Thanks, so with that, I think we can close this first hearing and we can move on to the second hearing for this evening, um, which is a, a public hearing and discussion on the proposed environmental protection chapter of the Lewis Municipal Code covering gas powered landscaping equipment and current littering and outdoor smoking uh, chapters. Uh, and uh, this uh, was discussed uh, and uh, we're now here to a public hearing. Uh, we have had some correspondence on it and I noticed that uh, we have one person in the uh, attendees, uh, Ed Fleming, the owner of uh, Lawns Unlimited, who's in the chat with us as well this evening or in the uh, attendee list with us. Perhaps uh, Emory, you could elevate Ed. I, I think he would like to comment at some point. Uh, the correspondence we have uh, in hand, I think all of you have received them. We have correspondence from Double E, Bellaterra, and Jim Berrigan had sent a letter or an email uh, over the weekend. Uh, those I think you've all had an opportunity to see that correspondence. So we uh, put I, I didn't have the double E one on the website, but the other correspondence is on the website. There was also something from Candace Vasella when this came up back in um right September so, or right. August or whatever. And and Marie, was there anything from um from uh, uh the green team at St. Peter's? I did not see anything from them. I was told I haven't they seen to send something in, but I, I don't know if they did. I didn't see anything either, Rob. Okay, okay uh, so uh, we are, Ed, you're, uh, you're unmuted, I believe, and you're welcome to um, bring yourself up uh, on the video if you want to talk to us in person, or you can just okay. speak from, the, yep. Can you hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Thanks All for right, taking time okay. to be here. Thank you and good evening members of the city council. So um, just to give a little bit of background. Um, my name is Ed Fleming. I'm an owner of Lawns Unlimited for the last 36 years, um, operating in the Lewis Milton Rehoboth area. And um, we've been looking at battery operated um, blowers, trimmers, weed eaters, chainsaws for the last five years. And within the last two years, the battery technology has just catapulted itself tremendously just from two years ago. Um, I'm very conscious about, we use a lot of gasoline powered blowers, weed eaters and trimmers. And the problem that we run into with these gasoline powered units is with the actual um, the new ethanol, the 10% ethanol in the gasoline, we're getting moisture that's being absorbed into the gas. And so we have a very hard time starting the, uh, the units up. So what we've done is we've actually gone to a, what they call the VP gas. And even when you buy 55 gallon drums of this material, it's like $8 a gallon for the gasoline that we have to use now for these, um, to mix the gas and oil with in order for them to run because they it will not absorb the moisture into the gas. You know, if they're sitting and next thing you know, it gets in the carburetors and then you're sitting there trying to, you know, start a piece of equipment and we've all been there and it's very frustrating. And it takes a lot of time. So um, I love battery operated uh, products. We own a Tesla. We've had it since 2016. It's the best car I think we've ever owned. And um, so with that, I've been working with a lot of different battery powered uh, units as far as landscaping is concerned. So I got some examples here. So Echo makes probably the best blower, handheld blower. Currently there is no um, backpack blower available. There's a backpack battery system, which you have like three or four batteries on a backpack and then there's a unit which is plugged into your handheld blower, trimmer, weed eater, whatever the case may be. But to, the, to date, there's not a backpack blower um, available from any of the different manufacturers. Echo, uh, it costs around 200 or $330, the battery's $289, and then uh, the charge time on it's one hour. Um, 
now when you're using a blower, uh, you're trying to spin air. So the, they're not as quiet as one would think because you're using fans to create velocity. Uh, this particular unit will do 550 cubic feet per minute at 145 miles an hour with a uh, noise level of 59 decibels. The steel um, is $400 for the blower. The battery system's a $1,300. Uh, the charge time on that unit's three to four hours. And um, it will blow a volume of uh, 541 cubic feet per minute, 188 miles an hour with, a, again, a, approximately the same decibels of 59. Um, to equate apples for apples, a steel backpack blower, which will kind of compare to the two battery operated units that I just spoke about, it costs about $450. It does 220 miles an hour as far as the speed, 642 cubic feet per minute, and a decibel level of 77. So um, we just were working at my house uh, after a storm, and I have a steel pole chainsaw, and we put one battery in it, and it lasts almost seven hours. Wow. when we were using it. So I took the same battery and put it in the blower and I was blowing leaves off our pool deck because we were getting our pool closed. And within 15 minutes, that same battery died. So you can see the blowers are using a lot more energy to spin the fan in order to blow, you know, leaves or any other type of landscape debris. The, the, Echo unit has a booster button on it, so if you have wet leaves or um, you know a larger pile of leaves as you're accumulating the leaves, then what happens there is um, you use that boost button, but it sucks the battery right down to like 10 minutes. So the issue is um, you have to have a lot of batteries on hand in order for you to utilize the backpack all day if you know if you're a company and you're going from one customer to the next customer um you have to have a lot of batteries in stock so or and you have to rotate them within because you're looking at a you know one hour charge minimum on a battery itself to get it back to full charge so you're looking at at least you have to have four batteries so you can switch them around the other thing is it takes longer for you to blow the leaves because you don't have the higher cubic feet per minute or miles per hour. So it's going to take your landscape companies longer to do the job, which in turn is going to cost the customers more money. And the upfront cost of the battery operated controller is, or the battery operated um, units are a lot more money because of the because of the batteries themselves and the charging units. So um, probably I talked to the manufacturers, and they're looking at possibly within five years, they'll have the technology and the um, units that will be able to um, equal the gas powered backpack blowers. They will have backpack blowers or they are working on them right now. Um, but at the same time, we, there's just, uh, we're still in the early parts of the, of the technology in order to get us where we need to be to become efficient for our customers so that we can get the job done in a, you know, um, best possible, fastest, quickest way. And also, you know, for the environment, as far as, you know, the, the pollution from, you know, the gas powered two cycle, you know, blower. So that's where we're at. Okay. And I understand that uh, there's a, what, a national lawn maintenance business uh, convention every year uh, that uh, probably didn't happen this year. Is that when new tech, we can expect new technology to be shown and all that, I would assume so from my experience with trade shows. Is, is the five years what you're hearing from a lot of people, or is it, uh, is it do other people? I noticed that there's quite a bit of advertising at the residential level for battery powered things beginning to surface in some of the home improvement stores. Um, 
I would assume that's much lower power and uh, probably doesn't have as long as the life of the battery. You want to comment um, on how that's going? Uh, yes, it's the, what we were uh, referring to is the GIE show, which is down in um, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and it goes on the end of October of every year, but due to COVID, they're not having it. But yeah, I talked to all the um, vendors down there um, because most of the vendors at that show is a national show. So all, all the top brass from the different manufacturers are there. So you're able to, you know, get the direct answers for the questions that you're asking. And they said, yeah, about another uh, five years, they'll, they'll be there. I mean, the battery, we started uh, with battery technology about mm, 2013, 14 timeframe. Um, and it's come a long way since then. Uh, the stuff that you see in Ace Hardware and Lowe's is the same stuff that, um, you know, you have uh, best equipment out there now in, uh, by the uh, Hopkins Dairy Farm. They have all the steel products. The Southern states have steel products. So the, there isn't much more uh, commercial than what you see in the residential areas. So hmm. it's, there's not uh, hardly any commercial they're working on it, but they're, I mean, they're working on the mowing, the mowers right now. There's, um, you know, the self-propelled push mowers, and then you have the, um, the, there's another battery company, you know, that they're doing the, um, something that's equal to our Xmark um, mower the 60 inch mower so they have all that technology right now but as far as um the it's coming it's it's on its way it's just you know new technology the batteries is where it's at trying yeah. to get the, the longest charge and the long the longest charge and then the runtime so for example this battery powered echo for 330 bucks they said it has a runtime of eight to nine hours. Okay. Well, the steel one says about the same thing, but that's the blower. <laughs> I don't know where they came up with their, their uh, statistics on this, but I put, did the pool deck, had a full charge battery, and in 15 minutes, I had to put another battery in. Okay. But that same battery running a, a chainsaw <laughs> lasted seven hours. But the okay. blower, it just sucked the power right out of it. And then um, we have trimmers too, because they're awesome. The battery power trimmers are unbelievable. They're, they're really neat. And they last a long time also, seven, eight hours on one battery. If we had that type of runtime on a blower, then yeah, it, we'd be using a lot more of it. But right now, uh, it's just not there. Ed, are you using the chainsaws and the trimmer or the, the trimmers already in a commercial setting? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So the only thing you're not really using that's battery operated is the is the blowers. Is that right? That Pretty is much? correct. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, yes, Rob. I really appreciate Mr. Fleming's expertise, and I'd like to tap it a little bit more with a few questions, but I don't want to take time from others who might want to talk. And I wonder if Mr. Fleming is able to stay around a, a, a few more minutes. Sure. Okay. Great. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks a lot, Ed. I appreciate your staying. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, we still have eight attendees. Uh, I noticed Jim Berrigan is on, and, and he uh, did write a letter, uh, if he'd care to speak, or if there's anyone else uh, in the attendee file who would, like to, uh, who would like to speak up, we'd be happy to listen. Well, I could speak just briefly, Ted. Okay. Uh, I was watching an ad on TV last night for some car manufacturer, I forget who, and they were advertising an SUV that now gets 500 some miles on a battery charge. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't too long ago that you would get maybe 100 miles on a battery charge. Mm -hmm. So the technology is rapidly advancing. And I'm pleased to hear Mr. Fleming's using so much uh, are getting away from the gasoline engine and going battery powered. But at what point do we say you really need to move there a little quicker? Or uh, if you don't start using the electric technology, then there's no 
incentive for the manufacturers to introduce it. So I guess it's a catch-22 situation. Okay. Well, I appreciate him speaking. I did learn a little bit from him tonight, but uh, I think we need to move there and okay. set a date and be part of the solution, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Martha, I just unmuted Marta. Yeah, Marta, you want to have you have something to say? You need to un, uh, need to unmute yourself, Marta. Myself there. I am. Hi, I just um, what I haven't been able to attend meetings lately, so I just saw this and uh, saw what was on the agenda, and I've always been a long advocate of getting rid of those noise making, polluting machines, especially the leaf blowers, because that leaves can be raked and leaf blowers blow around pollen and pesticides and herbicides all over the place and um, they're just not efficient. Um, I wonder also, it sounds like this ordinance doesn't have much of a chance uh, because the technology that makes it easier to uh, continue mowing lawns with machines is not quite there yet um, when people don't want to use uh, hand powered <laughs> machines right but could there be some way of reducing the amount that these machines are used through incentives to uh, maybe encourage people to reduce their lawns uh, have some uh, you know do rain gardens like you have in canal front park uh, since we do have a lot of uh, high water table that probably would be a benefit to people in areas that get a lot of flooding like ours um, ground covers, alternative ground covers that don't need to be mowed. I think, uh, I guess the love for lawns in, in this country isn't, um, it just doesn't seem to make sense. And could there be incentives uh, or would that be uh, just a non-starter? I don't know. Uh, do you all want to see lawns everywhere because it's so pretty? Or do you encourage people to put in meadows in their yards, for instance? I mean, I guess there may be some restrictions on how high the grass is, so that might be have to be changed to do that. But the, I just don't, uh, I'll tell you what, we go outside and invariably somebody's mowing the lawn or leaf blowing and then someone else does it. It's not all at the same time, so you don't have any time, weekend, weekdays, it's always there. And also the, the streets are full of uh, the trucks that uh, tow these machines around. Uh, that, it's pretty unsightly, but those are just my comments uh, to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Okay. Anyone else care to comment? Yeah, I, I have some questions. Yeah. yeah okay. I, 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 if no one else, I think we're ready to go back to you, Rob. Go ahead. Okay, but I didn't want to jump in front of the public, but I do have. Uh, uh, Mr. Fleming, you still around? Yes, yes I am. Hey, yes. Very much for your expertise. I had a few questions for you. Oh, the, the proposed ordinance covers uh, landscaping equipment and it, it says lawnmowers, leaf blowers, weed eaters, trimmers, and other equipment. Are there, I mean, obviously the, each one is uh, better or not so good for battery power. You mentioned that trimmers are fine. What about the others? I mean, wh where are you on on battery powered mowers, for instance? Um, the battery powered mowers are, because there's not many of them manufactured and the batteries are very expensive, they're very expensive compared to the gasoline mowers that you know, are currently on the market. So again, it's the introduction and then as soon as they get to build, you know, the large, mass volumes like they do on the gasoline uh, products, they'll become more competitive as in price. Um, the, the, the problem with the, I d do not have a push mower, battery operated push mower. Um, we have gasoline ones because we have a 36, 32 to 36 inch width, which helps us out because you make less trips, you're getting the job done faster and you can be more competitive priced for your customer. Um, the weed eaters, um, again, they're 
they're not using as much of the battery, so they're kind of like a chainsaw. They're excellent as far as you know the weed eaters are concerned. Okay. Um, and again, I love the battery technology because we don't have to worry about the problem that we're running in with weed eaters is the guys using them are so used to having the strings really long and there's a shield on there with with a cutting edge on it so when you tap the bottom of the weed eater it extends the string out and then it cuts it to length that length is very important for the simple fact that that's what the length of the string needs to be so as soon as you buy a 400 hundred dollar weed eater you give it to the guys and you tell them not to take the shield off they take the shield off because they use it for edging sidewalks curves and right. the shrub beds when they do that they extend the string out so long yep. that the motors start to carbon up because they're run it, they're not running they're running too much string which bogs the motor down which actually takes in carbons right. up the inside and next thing you know um it reduces the weed eater life half life in half essentially that so with that i'm sorry is that for gas powered weed eaters you're talking about that yes. It up? yes and on as far as the electric ones are concerned they're good but if you if they put the string out longer it's just all it's going to do is run your battery down quicker mm -hmm. um it's not going to have anything to do with carbon or anything like that so um, the weed eaters are good. The trimmers are, are excellent. The chainsaws are excellent. Um, you know, I, I work around my place on a Sunday and you can't even hear, hear them run. You know, it's just, you just hear the saw cutting the wood and it's very, you know, you're not hearing that two cycle exhaust, you know, through the neighborhood or whatever the case may be. Okay. Well, I think that covers the, the uh, items. Um, that we were looking at. Let me ask you, you just raised two cycle, and that was one of my questions. From what I read, two cycle is significantly more polluting than, than four cycle because it's got this oil mix and the, the, the fuel didn't get all consumed. And so there's a lot of particle emissions as well as pollution. Is, is four cycle technology available for uh, leaf blowers and, and mowers? No. No, no there no it's not it's all two cycle everything is two cycle okay um what's the life of your equipment how i mean typically how long does your equipment last uh that's a good question that's a good question it depends upon the operator of course you know you got guys that take care of it and you got guys that don't take care of it and a lot of times it's it's how they put it back on the truck and you know put it down and put it back on the truck and they drop it or things of that nature but um a two cycle back plaque blower i probably two and a half to three years a weed eater you know if you take care of it um you're looking at and this is being run every day for 28 to 32 mowings a year uh so that'd be 28 to 32 weeks that thing's being you know these these pieces of equipment are being used every day so you know it it gets pretty good life but again it all depends on how it's taken care of and how how it's serviced but with our mechanics and with our techs using them that we're getting between two and a half three years out of them okay and the uh, you talk about, question oh sorry, sorry. I had a follow-up question on that, though, with respect to the servicing. Are there, um, have you had an occasion to service the battery-powered equipment, and are there in-house capabilities to do that, or are there folks around here that can repair the battery-powered equipment? Um, essentially, the battery pack, the battery equipment, there's really nothing that goes wrong with it. I mean, like on the trimmers, you have to, you know, sharpen the blades to trim bushes. You have to oil the blades. But other than that, it's just, it's very simple. The battery gets plugged in. It produces the energy to move the trimmer blades back and forth so you can trim. The, the battery-operated um, weed eater, uh, they have like a little grease fitting on it so that you, the 
the head at the bottom, you, you know, you put like a pump of grease in it every day and that's about it. So essentially, um, there is no service on the power unit whatsoever. And the only thing that you have to look at is how long the battery is going to last. And again, we're just still, we, I don't have that information yet. I, we've been using them, but they're still working. We bought a Tesla Model S in t June of 2016, and we haven't have it, had it serviced yet. The only liquid in the whole car is the um, windshield wiper fluid. So uh, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of like you use your cell phone. You plug it in, you use it, and then you park it in the garage, and you plug it in again. And just like that technology, that we're at 285 miles for that Model S, and now the new Model S, the long-range Model S, is getting 400 miles. So it's it's come a long way, and they're continuing to, you know, make it better and better every day. Uh, and just a couple more questions. Um, you said that the the when you use the same battery that lasts seven hours in a chainsaw, lasts 15 minutes on a leaf blower. I assume that, that that's the same for its gasoline consumption because it just needs more power. So it, uses yes, it just needs more power to, yes, it needs more power to produce that, the wind and the cubic feet per minute and the velocity, you know, as far as miles per hour. So um, with that, because you're spinning a fan and for some reason I thought it would get a lot better because I, I bought a cobalt one and it lasts about the same it has, it's an 80 watt battery and it I blow the leaves around the pool with it and you know it's a lot lighter my wife can use it so it's easier she doesn't have to put a big backpack on the on her back so but yeah we're only getting like 15 minutes you know 20 minutes max depending upon what speed you hit the you know the little button on the side you can boost it or you know just do a just the regular speed and based on that the but when you use a chainsaw when you use the trimmers it lasts you know six to seven to eight hours on a charge which is which is great but as far as the blower it, it just sucks the power right out of that battery for some reason so the and you also mentioned that the upfront cost on battery powered equipment is is higher because you got to buy the batteries as well as the equipment uh, is it over time not having to buy the eight eight dollar a gallon gas and not having to service it? Does that tend to shift towards gas powered equipment? I mean, the, does the cost differential begin to favor gas powered equipment over time, or does it? Yes, because the, it, if you're using if you're using the blowers, then yeah, the gas powered is way more efficient. And the biggest thing is we, it's just like if I come to your house, I'm gonna give you a price, you know, to remove the leaves from your house. And the one lady said, well, you can rake them. Well, <laughs> if you rake leaves, I mean, that's what we used to do before we had blowers, right? But the problem is, once you got the bill after I rake leaves versus blowing them, you're gonna you're gonna want me to blow your leaves. That's that's just simple. And then if I have to use a battery operated unit, not because of the cost of the batteries in the unit, it's just the amount of time that's gonna take to blow the leaves, and then you gotta go back and forth to switch batteries. Of course, the thing about gas, you have to go back and forth and fill the gas tank up, but that lasts a lot longer than. Uh, than the battery itself. You know, I can get on my my uh, Red Max backpack 8500 blower, which produces a lot of volume. I can get a lot done, and uh, it, that thing will last, you know, a couple hours on a on a full tank of uh, of two cycle fuel. Okay. So, last question for me, anyway. What does GIA stand for? The Grounds Ind Industry Expo, it's GIE. It's called the Grounds Industry Ground Expo. Industry Expo. Yeah. Thanks. And it's in Louisville every year, Louisville, Kentucky, except for this year. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. And thank you, Ed. I appreciate all your 
expertise and the knowledge you've brought to the table here this evening is very helpful. I'm glad to hear that your that chainsaws and trimmers and weed eaters are already in the your category of things you're using. That's helpful. Uh, we do have uh, one comment here from Deborah Ewalds. Uh, uh, she is suggesting that she supports uh, battery powered uh, machines, uh, but a suggestion would be to further promote uh, a green lawn care would be to stop irrigation of lawns within the city of Lewis. It would slow grass growth and save water. Win-win. Um, I don't know if you care to comment personally, uh, Deborah, but I did, I think, capture what you said in the chat. Uh, and then Marta said she wanted to speak. Do you want to speak again, Marta? I, I, we did, you did speak once. Do you want to speak further? Both no, of you. that was my initial right. request. I okay, agree right. with Deborah's comment, by the way. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, and Deborah just wrote back that she's all good. Uh, so I think we've covered her thought process, her thoughts on this as well. Any other comments from the chat or anyone else at the table here? Well, I'll just make a comment based on personal sure. experience. Um, I recently bought a, a battery operated lawnmower and, and I like it for all the reasons that have been discussed. But I mean, I have a relatively small yard and a full battery charge will just do barely do my yard. Now, you know, this is a, a consumer product and all that sort of thing, but I, I think it, all I guess I want to say is my experience sounds the same as, as Mr. Fleming's in that um, while the, the industry has come a long way, I mean, this, these battery operated lawnmowers weren't even available a couple of years ago. Um, it, they're, they're not quite there in terms, at least in my experience, um, and I'm just talking about a lawnmower here. Um, they're not quite there in terms of um, being able to 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 do to, to have a long lasting charge. So I'll just that's neither here nor there. I'll just sort of throw that on for from the personal experience category. And they are, I mean, they you know they they're not as loud as a lawnmower, but they're not quiet either. No, so, they're a, they're a little bit more quiet than an electric one is. Yeah. So for I mean, so for people who are annoyed by by the the um, the noise, and, and I I get that um, it's not going to go away completely, even with a battery, um, even with a battery feature. Right. We have one more comment here from Tom Panetta. I think it's important to emphasize that the sound of the leaf blowers is also due to the velocity. Uh, as an example, think about the noise from your bathroom fan. Uh, batteries are great, but they won't, uh, they, they don't want a false uh, expectation. Jim Berrigan has asked to speak, so I've just okay, Jim, unmuted him. You're back on. Hi, right. I've been Googling it and I can't really find a good answer. Is there any way to put mufflers on the, on the backpack weed blowers or leaf blowers? I, Ed, you want to answer that? Um, yes, Ted, the, the problem with the mufflers, there are mufflers on them. Um, I don't know if that I'd have to make some phone calls to see if there's an additional muffler system that could be placed on the unit, but there are mufflers on there, but it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, when you're revving that blower up, it's, it's screaming. And if you don't put your earplugs in, and you get done your ears are ringing so i can find out to see if there if there's a option to actually put a secondary muffler on there or if they can put a larger muffler on there to try to um you know make the noise level but there is mufflers on there but uh i guess they're made for the power of the unit and maybe not as much as, and I know California, New York, there's a lot of states that are outlawing these blowers um, in different states and counties and cities and things like that. But um, they're, I'm sure that the manufacturers are very um, up on this because they want to continue to, you know, sell their products. So maybe they're, they've been working on it. I don't know, but I can find out and get back to, to Ted. Great. Thank you. Ed. That would be helpful. If you could yeah. learn any more information that we would appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, great. Any other questions from the table or comments? Okay. Again, I want to, uh, and, and it looks like we have no further comments from the, our attendees. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ed for taking time tonight to be with us. It was a very helpful discussion. Uh, and I think all of us learned uh, a lot about what is currently being, uh, you're already using as battery power equipment, which is helpful for us to know. So uh, unless there's further comment from the table, I think we could entertain a motion to adjourn. Wait, wait a minute. Oh, hello, wait, wait. There's two more pieces to this ordinance. Okay. You, we want, you want to do the environmental. Right about that, Rob? There are two other pieces. Do you want? Do you want to take those up? I don't think those really represent any changes, Bob. Yeah. Did, okay. That, I just wanted to clarify. Did we change anything on litter or outdoor smoking? Um, it's, Bonnie, since I drafted it, let me uh, try that. Please. Outdoor smoking. When I looked at it. I didn't see any major changes there. Bonnie, there are not meant to be any substantive changes. There okay. Is not okay. Nothing. I know you. Yeah. Well, can, can I? Can, well, this is what threw me off, and this may be this may be in the in the current ordinance. And it is I, I I apologize, but under outdoor smoking, we we have a subsection B that says smoking prohibited at all times of year, and then we have a subsection C that says smoking shall be prohibited at all times of the year in the following outdoor places. I, is this a? I think. I mean, maybe Glenn can help, but this looks like confusing drafting to me. It makes it look like smoking is prohibited at all times of year, uh, everywhere. And then- What you're seeing, Bonnie? Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, uh, I'm looking at my draft, not the ordinance that uh, Glenn has done. But the first instance of smoking prohibited at all times of year is the heading. Mm -hmm. the, and then it, the paragraph, the text is, the second thing you quoted. Okay, that that's fine. That's good because the way it's the way it's written in in what I'm looking at that was posted in connection with this meeting. Yeah, it's got three subsections: A, definitions; B, smoking prohibited at all times of year; then C, a standalone, apparently equal provision that yeah. goes into the outdoor smoking. At so yeah, so really, it shouldn't be there. Shouldn't be a C. Okay, so we just need to fix that. Yeah, yeah. thank okay. you. Okay, right. thank you. There's only one other comment I would make to that, and that is, you know, we say that we don't currently, we don't have any things that we're operating that we don't own, but we might want to consider prospectively adding, you know, in all, uh, on the grounds of all buildings own, uh, owned or operated by the city. We're operated. Yeah. Now, how long will we leave the public record open for this, uh, either of these? I think we could leave, uh, well, we're not going to get this, and we're not going to get to this until our December meeting. Uh, I would say we could certainly leave it open until, uh, how about if we uh, look to close it on the, the 25th, which is the eve of Thanksgiving? Ted, uh, on that, I've never understood why we want to close it any sooner than we have to. Okay, you want to wait and, you want to wait and close it? We have to close it. Um, I mean, you, you want to hold it uh, until you, we could hold it open until the uh, the fourth of December. Yeah, I think that my my thinking is, if there's time for comments to be posted, okay, uh, then that's enough time. But okay, okay. So if we uh, if we close it on the fourth of December, that's fine. Great. Is that acceptable to everybody. Sure. Okay. That gives us plenty of time to uh, get them posted uh, in a timely manner because we would have to post on the 7th of December the, the, the agenda. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. All right. Anything else to bring forward? I move to adjourn. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Can I ask one quick question? Yes, Marta. Uh, I asked once before, but I don't know if the city is going to work on this. Is there a way? for you to show us who is on these meetings? There isn't, I don't believe. Um, uh, so it's a lot different from public hearings in person if you can't even know who you're speaking in front of, but okay. Well, you, you, you know who is in, the, you know who's um, attending as, an, as a participant or a panelist. Yeah. Uh, what you don't have, you don't have the audience. Right. <laughs> now tonight, there, uh, there were only uh, eight people in the audience. Uh, so you you pretty much, with the exception of 
Um, let's see, who didn't speak? Uh, actually, I think the only person that's still on that didn't speak was Trina Brown Hicks. Okay, to address you. that, Ted, it, it may be possible. We know that when we attend a, a class at OSHA, for instance, you can see everybody who's on. Right. And, well, we can look into that. Um, so far, we haven't been able to do that, okay? It's a different- Somebody who's got more technical skills than I would have to look at that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, our Zoom meetings, we have everybody's on the, everybody on there too, because I think some people might be afraid to talk if they don't know who's in the audience. Okay, good point. I get it. All right, anything else to bring up? I think we have a motion and a second to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Thank you all very much. I think it was a good discussion this evening. Thanks. Have a good evening. Hopefully we see some sunshine tomorrow. <laughs> good night.